One of the accusations we often hear from the other side is how can this crime be committed against Lady Fatima alayhi salam while Imam Ali chooses not to react? This they say is impossible given Imam Ali's bravery and valor. How do you respond to that? The first thing we'll say in response is who told you Amir al-Mu'mineen did not react? This stems from our lack of knowledge, from our ignorance. Assuming that Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Mawla al-Muwahideen, Sayyid al wasiyin would simply stand by and see these travesties take place without so much as an objection or any form of resistance is something that we also reject. Amir al-Mu'mineen did react. Amir al-Mu'mineen did in fact fight back. If you refer to Kitab Sulaym ibn Qais al-Hilali that I mentioned last night, which is probably the first chronicle of early Islamic history, in particular one that covers the formative period of the Khilafah, beginning with the death of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, this gives Kitab Sulaym ibn Qais even greater prominence and importance because it was the first book. That book goes into detail about the ambush against the house of Fatima al-Zahra, Ruhi Fidaha. And in it he says um, that when they first attack the house, I'm going to read his words verbatim. فَوَثَبَ عَلِيٌّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Meaning Amir al mumineen when they entered the home. Now just try and visualize this for a moment. I'm skipping the part where they come to threaten to burn down the house. And also the initial ambush. When the door which was almost completely decimated and burnt, is pushed to the ground, leaving Fatima to be crushed between the wall and the door, I'm skipping all that part, because again, you could pause and zoom in and take all the tragedy in. But after that, Amir al-Mu'mineen jumps to his wife's rescue. Now, what you need to understand is that the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the house of Fatima al-Zahra was very, very small. We're talking about perhaps a hundred meters squared, maybe even less. It has a door that leads into the Masjid of Rasulullah. It also has another door that leads to the street. The ambush took place from both directions. There were people standing inside the masjid ensuring that Amir al-Mu'mineen and his family do not exit through that door. The main attackers though came from the street entrance. The door was burning. The house was filled with smoke. The ambush takes place. We're talking about a few dozen, a few dozen men. So not one or two people. Their names are explicitly mentioned in history books. We're talking about Qunfud al-Adwi alayhi la'a'inullah. He was a fellow tribesman of the first Khalifa. And someone who was then awarded the governorship of Mecca and told that he is excluded from having to pay taxes to the central government. So his province was the only one that wasn't required to pay any taxes. They convey this to Amir al muminin The Imam says, Shakara lahu li Fatima alayhi salam. This is as a reward for his central role in the attack against Fatima al Zahra. He's being compensated here. So Qunfid was one of them, Khalid ibn al Walid was another. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was another. 
Mughira ibn Shu'ba was another. All these people participated in the ambush. Fatima to Zahra is lying unconscious. Between the wall and the door. This group of thugs breaks into the home. Ali and his children, Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, Um Kulthum, Fidda, they have nowhere to go. Amir al Mu'mineen sits idly by. La wallah. Fawathaba Ali yun. Amir al Mu'mineen jumps. He goes to where Fatima is lying on the ground, and all these thugs are storming into the house. Fa'akhada bi talabibi Umar. He held the collar of the leader of the thugs. Thumma hazzahu. He gave him. One, he shook him and threw him to the ground. فَصَرَعَهُ وَوَجَأَ أَنْفَهُ Then the Imam rubbed his nose against the ground. In other words, he held him by the head. This is Ali we're talking about. فَاتِحُ خَيْبَ فَوَجَأَ أَنْفَهُ The Imam held him to the ground. وَهَمَّ بِقَتْلِهِ The Imam was about to kill him. You ambush my home and dare attack my wife? You deserve to be killed right here, right now. فَهَمَّ بِقَتْلِهِ فَذَكَرَ قَوْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ It was at that point that the Imam remembered the instructions and advice that were given to him by Rasulullah. It doesn't say this in this particular report. But what it means is the Prophet had instructed him to refrain from engaging militarily, to not fight back. فَذَكَرَ قَوْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ Then the Imam said to this man, whose nose was now being rubbed against the sands as he deserves. He said to him, يَبْنَ صَحَّاك He reminded him of his mother and his grandmother who were quite famous around town. The Imam called him by his mother's name, Yabna Sahak, Lawla Kitabu Min Allah, Sabaka La Alimta Annaka Lantatkula Bayti. Had it not been for the fact that I have received clear instructions from Rasulullah, I would show you. And I would stop you from ever setting foot into my home and violating its sanctity. So, let's go back to the original question. How is it that Amir al-Mu'mineen didn't react? Well, I dispute the premise of the question. Amir al-Mu'mineen did in fact react. So, now you have to rephrase the question into something like this. Why is it that Amir al-Mu'mineen didn't fight back all the way to the end? Why didn't he fight until he was killed? That's what you want to say. And the answer to that is found in this ziyarah of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in which we say, وَأَشْبَهَتْ مِحْنَتُكَ مِحْنَةَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, your tragedy was like the tragedy of previous prophets. Why? Which previous prophets? Remember when Musa alayhi salam comes back from the Tur returns to his people, 40 days passed. By the way, this is a very important point. People sometimes say, but how could all of the companions of Rasulullah turn on their heels? How could they all become apostates? How could they all abandon the Prophet and his religion and his message? It's right here in this verse. Musa comes back. وَوَعَدْنَا مُوسَى ثَلَاثِينَ لَيْلَةً وَأَتْمَمْنَاهَا بِعَشْرًا فَتَمَّمْ مِقَاتُ رَبِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً when Musa comes back 40 days later, they're all bowing down before the golden calf, like a bunch of animals. These were people who had witnessed miracles. These were people who had seen with their own eyes how Musa parted the sea to save them from Pharaoh. These were people who had been persecuted under the Fir'aun, and yet all it took was 40 days to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, Musa comes back, he was so shocked, the Qur'an tells us, when he saw this scene, all these 
60, 70, I believe, 70,000 Israelites were all worshipping the golden calf instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He threw the tablets that he had just received from Allah. The tablets that had the Ten Commandments inscribed on it. God's revelation. He threw them on the ground. Forget the tablets. They're worshipping a golden calf, an idol. He then ran towards his brother. He grabbed him by the head. This is all in the Quran. And he began to pull him, saying, What have you done? I was only away for 40 days. What does Harun say? Yabna um, inna al qawm astadhafuni wa kadu yaqtulunani. Oh, son of my mother. In other words, he's pleading with him. My dear brother, these people istadhafuni. What does this mean? It means they deemed me too weak. I didn't have any helpers. I didn't have any support. What am I supposed to do? وَكَادُوا يَقْتُلُونَنِي They almost killed me. So please, don't do this to me. Don't think that I abandoned them. Look, I didn't have any help. Prophet Lut also says the same thing. He says, if I had if I had something I could lean on, these people wouldn't outpower me. Right? Every other prophet of God was abandoned at some point. Didn't have any help, didn't have any support, didn't have any companions. Why didn't Amir al-Mu'mineen fight all the way to the end? Because had he done so, he would have been killed. Fatima would have been killed. Al-Hasan would have been killed. al Hussein would have been killed. Islam would have been destroyed. And those vile idol worshippers would have restored Islam back to the Jahiliyyah which was their goal all the way from the beginning. Ali ibn Abi Talib didn't have any helpers. He said, if I have 40 people, that's all I ask. 40 individuals. Sallallahu alayka ya awwala mabnum. All he asked for was 40 individuals to show up. And he said, if you're willing to help, come tomorrow at dawn, and I wish to see your sh heads shaved. That would be the sign that you're here to support Ali. To have shaved heads crying out, Haydar, Haydar. And yet when he shows up, there's only four people there. al maqdad Salman, Abu Dhar. And Ammar shows up later. How was Amir al-Mu'mineen supposed to fight back? Because it wasn't the practice of prophets and messengers to always get their way no matter what. It wasn't something that they did where they would use miracles to win every battle. That's not how it works. Even the Prophet ﷺ goes to the battle of Uhud, gets injured. The Prophet's front teeth were broken. He was injured from head to toe. Could the Prophet have used some kind of a miracle to get his way? Of course he could. That's not how Allah works. Miracles are by definition an exception from the rule. Not the rule itself. Why didn't Amir al-Mu'mineen fight all the way? Because that's how prophets acted as well. When they didn't have help, they would either refrain or they would be outnumbered and outpowered. One final response I'll give to this misconception because it's quite prevalent and common is that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatih, he says, وَلَوْ تَزَيَّلُوا لَعَذَّبْنَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا He says, if the believers and the non-believers were separated from each other completely, if we were able to sift through the good and the bad, then God's punishment would come down. But the reason Allah refrains from punishing people is that ultimately the good is mixed with the bad. If the good isn't mixed physically with the bad, then you have those who are evil, but in whose lineage there are good people. And vice versa, those who are good, but in whose lineage there are bad people. Why else do you think Amir al muminin would summon Malik al-Ashtar back when he was only a stone throw away? from the tent of Muawiyah ibn Hind. 
the Imam sent him a messenger telling him to come back. That's it. The battle is over. I have agreed to their terms. They said that the Quran, let the Quran judge between us. Malik asked the messenger to hurry back to Ali ibn Abi Talib, to his master, Amir al Mu'mineen. Same time, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I am so close to the tent of Muawiyah. I could have him killed right now and end this fitna forever. But the Imam says to him, Come back. Why would he do that? Because ultimately this life is a test. Because we're supposed to be subjected to these trials. Because we're supposed to decide which side of history we wish to stand on. We're supposed to look at these, these stories, learn about these actions, and decide for ourselves who was right and who was wrong and where we choose to stand. Ultimately, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he wasn't afraid of fighting. Ali, afraid of fighting? Are you kidding? Which is why <coughs> Al-Allam Al-Amini, Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alayhi, and upon every slave and servant of Amir al muminin <coughs> he says that I did not see the courage of Ali in Badr or Khaybar. I didn't see the valor and fearlessness of Ali in the battles of Safin and Nahrawan, I saw the valor, the courage, the bravery, the greatness, the patience of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he had to witness his wife being slapped and not respond by fighting all the way to the end. It is harder for him to refrain from engaging at this point than to actually fight. Right? One last point I'll mention about this, perhaps something you haven't heard before. Did you know that when they attacked the house of Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa, it was a, a delegation that came from Egypt. Because of the rampant corruption of Uthman's governor in Egypt, Egyptians were fed up with this Khalifa. So they sent a delegation. The delegation went to the palace of the Khalifa Eventually, they stormed in, they climbed up the walls, stormed into the house, and approached Uthman and his wife. When it came to his wife, they did things which were, let's just say, indecent, right? Uthman was told, why don't you respond? He said, because لِوَصِيَّةٍ أَوْصَانِيهَا حَبِيبِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Ya أَخِي fight back! He's like, no, the Prophet told me that I should be patient, I shouldn't fight back. So here's my question to anyone from the other side who tells me, how could Ali ibn Abi Talib? Well, my question to you is, what, what about Uthman? Why is it that Uthman can simply find refuge I mean, at least when it comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen, he was always the star of every battle. Everyone else on the battlefield roamed and revolved around Ali ibn Abi Talib. Uthman, on the other hand, was nowhere to be seen. So, when it comes to the courage to fight back, there's no question that Ali ibn Abi Talib had no problem in that area whatsoever. Uthman's situation, however, is rather questionable. So... Why is it that Uthman can make up the excuse that I can't fight back because the Prophet told me to, told me to be patient, that is. But when it comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen, all of a sudden you have a problem with that. So, glass houses and all. <laughs>